Chapter 21, Butterfly Wishes. Our classroom is brainstorming ideas for a community service project. Shay raises her hand. I am having a birthday party and inviting everyone because I don't want to leave anyone out. How does that relate to our community service project? Keisha asks, and the whole class waits for an answer. Well, it's about community. Everyone being involved. Yeah, right, Keisha whispers to me. Mr. Daniels compliments Shay on inviting everyone and moves on quickly. Later, as we get our stuff for lunch and recess, Shay speaks to Jessica in her loud voice. I'm so mad my mother is making me invite everyone. Then she looks directly at Keisha and me and says, I hope some people know better than to actually show up. My mom insists I go to Shay's party, even after I tell her that Shay is mean. My mom asks, well, there will be other kids there, right? You may actually have fun. Albert grabbed his inv invitation from the mailbox before his mother saw it. Keisha's family is visiting her grandmother, so I'm alone. At lunch, I ask Albert and Keisha about some diseases I can use as an excuse not to go. How about bubonic plague? Otherwise known as black plague, Albert asks. Keisha almost spits out her milk. Seriously? Uh, that may be a bit much, I say. But then I begin to wonder, what does that look like anyway? Oh, well, chills, fever, cramps, seizures, toes, fingers, nose, and lips turn black because the cells die, and you'd likely spit blood. Albert? Keisha says. That's nuts. She can be sick like a normal person, you know. Cough, runny nose. Sound familiar? That's fine, he says, taking a bite of his sandwich. It just seems uninteresting. That's all. Shay's party is at the Butterfly Gardens, and when I arrive, I recognize some girls from other classrooms. They're all wearing friendship bracelets. Jessica wears even more now. I still ache to have some and wonder if Keisha would like a bracelet like that. Soon, we are lined up and brought to the main butterfly garden, which is a clear plastic tent set up inside a bigger room. The tent is filled with plants and flowers, and flying around are tons of butterflies. People stand there as butterflies land on them, and you can feel how happy people are just by watching their eyes. Before we enter the tent, a lady talks to us about the butterflies. She tells us about their patterns and to look for ones with giant dot on each wing. These are adaptations to scare other animals into thinking they are eyes, so other animals will think they are bigger and more dangerous and leave them alone. I wish I could do this with Shay, and that Albert could do that with those boys. She reminds us not to grab any butterflies, because they are injured easily. We are supposed to stand and let them come to us. Then the, la the lady points to me and says, they'll love your orange shirt. She's right, the butterflies do come to me. Their colors and patterns make me wonder why I haven't been drawing butterflies. They don't fly like birds. Instead, they kind of fly all over the place. Makes me wonder if I'm part butterfly. I put my arms out like a tree, and one, th and one then two land on my arm. I love them. I never knew before how much I love butterflies. I think about the story Albert told in social studies when we were studying Native Americans. He said that they believed butterflies were special creatures and wish givers, and that if you can catch a butterfly, whis whisper your deepest wish to it, and then set it free. It will carry your wish to the spirits, who will grant it. I would never grab a butterfly, but one once again, my hands do things without my say-so. When a beautiful, bright orange and black one lands on my hand, I loosely close my fist around it. And then my thinking part steps forward and quickly realizes what I've done. I open my hand and the butterfly zigs and zags before landing on the ground. The lady who gave us directions is next to me in a second. Oh no, what have you done? She asks. I want to explain about my wish givers, but Shay and the others appear. It figures it was Allie. She probably killed it. Everyone knows you can't touch a butterfly's wings. I didn't kill it. I mean, I would never hurt it. I 
had a wish and I thought that... The girls laugh. Such a freak show, Shay says. Suki rushes to the butterfly to try to help, but a woman runs over and tells her to step back. Who are you with? The woman asks me. Shay's mother steps forward. She's with us, but she's not my daughter. She's part of my daughter's party. I wish my own mom were here. She'd understand. I feel terrible watching the butterfly on the ground, flapping its wings and not going anywhere. I know that feeling. The first butterfly lady wears white gloves and she puts the injured one in a box, saying, at least its wings weren't torn. The second lady stares at me like I'm a ruthless butterfly hunter. I want to say I'm sorry, but I forget to because I'm watching mind movies of the butterfly falling and falling and never being better. And then the movie is filled with butterflies that are all falling like rain. And I feel as sad as I did watching the real one fall. Suki comes over. I know you didn't hurt the butterfly on purpose. Thanks, I mumble. She's right, but it was still my hand. I guess I, guess I just had to make a wish. Sometimes a person will do just about anything for a wish to come true. Chapter 22 No Way to Treat a Queen Later, I try to call Albert, but a recording says that the number is no longer in service, and I worry that he had to move away or something. When I see him at school on Monday, I am so relieved. I run up to him. Albert, is it true that if you touch a butterfly's wings... You keep it from flying ever again? Basically kill it? A rather curious question for such a cold day. In t temperatures such as these, Albert, just tell me, yes or no? No, it's a myth that you render a butterfly unable to fly by touching its wings. The powdery residue on their wings is actually scales. They shed these scales on a regular basis, so merely touching them is okay. You only injure the butterfly if its wings are torn. I remember how the lady said its wings weren't torn. I hug Albert until I've realized what I'm doing. His surprised expression is so hilarious. Like Einstein himself just told him that Earth is not round, but instead shaped like a spoon. Nice shirt, Albert. Is it new? Shay laughs at her own comment. Before he can answer, she draws her fingers down her own sleeve. I got a new sweater. It's purple, which is a color of royalty, she says, looking directly at me. That's why it's my favorite. I wonder what she wants from us, and I hate that I never know what to say to her. I come up with great comebacks to her the next morning, hunched over a bowl of cereal. Indeed, purple is the color of royalty, Albert tells Shay. Yes, yes it is. Her voice is sing-songy and makes me wish she'd go eat paste. You two are just so uncouth, she turns to me. I bet Allie doesn't even know what the word uncouth even means, do you? I know what uncouth means, Albert says. I know something else, too. Only an uncouth person would wear snail snot. She looks at us like we're wearing, like we're wearing it. You say purple is the color of royals, he says. They only wore purple because it was the most difficult and expensive color to make. In medi medieval times, they needed to collect 3,000 Murex Brandera snails to have enough slime to make one cloak. So good for you. I'd prefer beige. He turns to me. What about you, Allie? Slime or beige? Oh, I'd have to go for beige. I try not to smile as much as I want to, and I try to keep my voice from sounding as happy as it is, because the look on Shay's face when she looks down at her new sweater, like she's actually covered in snail slime, is pretty unforgettable.